Chapter 6. Examples from the Past Nailed to the stake on which Joan of Arc was burned was a sign which read, Joan, who had called herself the maid, a liar, pernicious deceiver of the people, sorceress, superstitious, blasphemer of God, defamer of the faith of Jesus Christ, boastful, idolatrous, cruel, dissolute, invoker of demons, apostate, schismatic, and heretic. That was May 30th, 1431. Twenty-five years later, she was declared innocent by the highest ecclesiastical authorities. As recent as 1920, she was canonized a saint by the Roman Catholic Church. In the heat of human events, we are often blind to the light. Time is a relentless teacher, but we mortals are poor students of her lessons. The charges of heresy and sorcery all centered around her claim to have received guidance from celestial voices and her practice of donning male attire. She was, to be sure, a mystic. However, as such, she was no more worthy of capital punishment than was Teresa of Avila or our own American, Anne Hutchison. She was, of course, a scourge to the British and eventually a thorn in the side of her French superiors who sought a compromise peace agreement with the British. Hence the need to dispose of her, who was so powerful a popular leader of the army and France. We cannot avoid a digression here. An analogy thrusts itself to the fore. The pro-life movement in America in the year 1993 and the liberation movement in France in 1431. The French wanted the occupying British forces out. Joan had summoned and inspired her countrymen to war against the British. But as the war continued, she wanted to press on to complete the expulsion, while the leaders of France desired to sue for peace. Similarly, users of force have sought ostensibly to expel abortionists from a given territory, while some activist pro-life leaders sought to make peace with the Clinton regime. Their hope was to avoid the artillery of the FACE legislation, Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrance Bill, which made interference of the abortion business a felony, punishable six months in prison for the first offense and 18 months for the second. A certain threat to their quote-unquote ministries. Have the means to this end entailed the public condemnation of the veritable rescuers, the shooters and bombers of abortionists and abortuaries? It may be a sacrifice worth as much to pro-life leaders as was Joan to the French. A brief examination of the maid's life and circumstances will serve to illumine some of the dynamics we now experience in the church with regard to the issue of godly force. Imagine various reactions to some of the aspects of Joan's life on the part of our contemporaries. She was a peasant girl. And in such an undemocratic era of blue-bloodedness, pomp, and propriety, the ascendancy of this woman to the headship of the French army is astounding. Yet she would certainly be on offense to many in these days. A woman, poor, no experience, no pedigree, just a calling from God. The prophet Amos comes to mind. No regular prophet. He had no membership with the Nabim, the guild of the prophets in Israel, present since at least the time of Saul. Rather, he was a lowly sheep herder, called by God. Who is this man? It is asked of Michael Griffin, the man who shot to death an abortionist, David Gunn, in March of 1993. We do not know him. He has not been out here on the streets with us before. He has no track record. A woman soldier? A female wielder of the sword? How inappropriate for a woman to do a man's job! Riding a horse astride and wearing male apparel! Deborah comes to mind. Summoning the armies of Israel against the oppression, the oppressing king of Hazor. And another woman comes to mind, Jael. When the enemy general Sisera fled in defeat, he sought refuge in the tents of Heber, the Kenite. As he slept, Heber's wife, Jael, drove a stake through Sisera's skull. Bloody women. But heroes by current now 
a militant feminist organization, standards. Joan's manly use of the sword in battle would have made Our Ladies of the National Organization of Women proud. However, the particular occasion of its use would have irritated them as it did the King of France in Joan's time, but for different reasons. We speak of the episode of the beating of the whores. Joan had threatened these liberated women on several occasions, but outside of Paris on about September 7th, 1429, Joan, quote, chased one of the prostitutes who persisted in following the army and struck her with the flat of the blade. The blow resulted in the death of the woman. Now, Charles VII, King of France, was not upset about the beating of the whore, rather, th rather that the sword was shattered in the course of the thrashing. The sword had been a special gift to Joan, and the breaking of it signified a possible bad omen. According to his reckoning, a good stick would have sufficed. Joan protected her purity, and to the end remained a Virgo intacta. After visiting her in prison, Anne of Burgundy ordered that a woman's dress should be made for Joan. A tailor, one jean Notin Simon, came in to make a fitting. While doing so, he fingered Joan's breast. Enraged, she pulled away from him and roundly boxed his ears. She had done the same thing to Aimon de Massy at Berevois when he jokingly tried to touch her breasts. The use of force in these instances might seem peculiar to those living in our age of sexual lawlessness, and yet her right to be weird and sexually deprived would be tolerated today. As a woman, free to do with her own body whatever she pleased, her choice to be chaste must be respected. How then would our godless moralists in this particular season judge Joan's use of force? We wager they would approve Joan's beating of the tailor, but condemn her thrashing of the whore. But what is the right attitude toward harlotry? What was the right action to take against those who were suborning the morality of the army? What is the, what is the attitude one ought to have towards those whose actions invited the judgment of God upon a whole army or nation? Our national abhorrence of violence is really quite a myth. We have a selective aversion to it. By way of example, in January 1994, a jury justified the action of Lorena Bobbitt, the wife who had the previous June used a kitchen knife to remove her husband's penis after he had fallen asleep. She was reckoned by the jury to be an abused woman. And even though her deed was committed not in prevention of violence, but in retaliation for alleged abuse, the jury defended her use of force by acquitting her. We are selective in the violence we approve, and the basis for that approval has more to do with public opinion than with God's word. The life of Joan of Arc serves to illustrate the fact that attitudes about legitimate use of force change from time to time. The proper attitude toward the use of force, we must be reminded, is one which is informed by biblical principles, not by the spirit of the times. Another principle illumined by her life is that of divine calling. Joan's military vocation is alleged to have been a divine answer to the prayers and hopes of a nation for national deliverance from occupation by a foreign power. Does God not raise up people for extraordinary deeds in times of crisis? If a nation is held captive by an oppressor from without, might God not raise up a champion even as he raised up the judges of Israel? Joan regularly spoke of being called by God. She constantly spoke of the heavenly voices which guided her efforts to arouse the French to war victoriously over the English. Indeed, she publicly predicated her entire effort upon the proposition that she was divinely anointed by God to lead the French army to victory. She clothed herself in male dress and defended herself thusly, When I have done that for which I have been sent by God, then I shall put on women's clothes. She announced her call in a letter to the English duke, of Bedford. King of England, and you, Duke of Bedford, who call yourself Regent of the Kingdom of France, acknowledge the summons of the King of Heaven, and render up to the maid, who is here sent by God, the King of Heaven, the keys of all the good towns you have here taken and violated in France. She has come here by God's will, to reclaim the blood royal. She is very ready to make peace. 
if you will acknowledge her to be right by leaving France and paying for what you have held. And you archers, companions of war, men-at-arms, and others who are before the town of Orleans, go away into your own country, by God, and if you do not so, expect news of the maid, who will come to see you shortly, to your very great injury. King of England, if you do not do so, I am chief of war, and in whatever place I reach your people in France, I will make them quit it, willy-nilly. And if they will not obey, I will have them all slain. I am sent here by God, the King of Heaven, to drive you, body for body, out of the whole of France. For God, the King of Heaven, wishes it so, and this is revealed by the maid. The modernist recoils in horror when someone presumes to have been inspired or actually called by God to a given task. How odd, we say of the mystic or Pentecostal who declares that God has spoken to him. As it may seem even odder with roles reverse when our Pentecostal friends shun another purported recipient of a divine call who declares he has been so called to wield godly force. Voices? Callings from God to slay people? In our post-Christian anti-supernaturalist age of Son of Sam's and sundry serial ki killers, there is low tolerance for people who claim to be led by God to do anything extraordinary. Joan of Arc's biographer says, In our own day, Joan of Arc would probably be regarded as deranged. Her visions or hallucinations, and the course of action, which they would drive her to try and impose upon those surrounding her, would render her incapable of taking her place satisfactorily in a society such as the one in which we now possess. In the Middle Ages, people had a stronger belief in the supernatural, and therefore a, therefore a much greater tolerance of individuals who claimed to be in touch with it. End quote. Our Christian brethren of the Middle Ages were not dupes, however. They were aware of the cosmic battle between good and evil. They were aware that servants of darkness were always trying to pass as ministers of light. We modernist Christians make the mistake of refusing to truly believe in divine judgments in history and the pending judgment of our own American nation. We cannot even entertain the idea that the use of force against abortion not only saves the life of the lives of innocent children, but may well hold back the supernatural judgment that comes from God upon nations which practice the idolatry of child slaughter. We respect that calling which God seems to have placed upon the life of Joan of Arc, and we respect as well the calling that God may well have placed upon the lives of Christians like Michael Griffin and Shelley Shannon. We trust that their attitudes may be summed up in the words of the maid when she was asked about any fears she had in carrying out her mission. I am not afraid of the men-at-arms, for my road lies open before me, and, if there are men-at-arms upon it, I have God, my Lord, who will well know how to open the road so I can go. I was born to do this. There is a lesson for us in the story of Joan of Arc. The reasons given for her prosecution were not true ones. It was not really witchcraft or attire or even insubordination which prompted her trial and condemnation. Rather, she was delivered up for expediency. The pursuers of peace needed to dispose of a warrior who would have carried the war to a hopeful conclusion, the expulsion of the English from French territory. Expedience is the reason that some have condemned those who have attempted to stop abortion by forceful means. Legislation which would sorely curtail anti-abortion protesting and abortuary blockades was the great threat to some establishment pro-lifers. They bowed before those who threatened their ministries and duly condemned extremists in hopes of preserving their own organizations. By pandering to government overlords with proclamations of their own peaceful and non-violent ways and joining in the general condemnation of the despised doers of quote-unquote violence, they denied what they knew to be the truth, viz. A -vis, that since abortion is truly murder, forceful, defensive intervention is justifiable. And so the pursuit of peace prevailed over principle. 
It was expedient to sacrifice the extremist in order to placate the abortion-promoting regime. So was Joan sacrificed, the righteous for the sake of a peace process. So also are Michael Griffin, Shelley Shannon, and all other wielders of godly force sacrificed for the peace of, quote-unquote, the movement. American Christians have their minds beclouded by the peace they have grown accustomed to. For 130 years, there has been no war on American soil. We love our peace along with our affluence. In fact, we worship it so that our aversion to violence has led us into sin. We sacrifice truth and justice to peace. Such has not always been the case. Christians through the ages have wielded godly force. The fact that ungodly force has also been wielded is beside the point. Just as the error of adultery is beside the point of the command to love one's neighbor. Abusus non tolit usum. Misuse does not nullify proper use. Defensive action has been justified for more than simply self-defense and the defense of innocent individuals. Legitimacy has been well argued for the more complicated issues such as regicide and revolution. How much easier, then, may we uphold the basic Christian tradition of defense of the innocent neighbor? We could list countless examples of figures walking in this historical biblical tradition. See Stephen Case, Defensive Arms Vindicated, 1783, in Political Sermons of the American Founding Era. Edited by Ellis Sandoz, Indianapolis, Liberty Press, 1991, pages 744 through 749. A few will suffice. The Maccabees, a band of zealous Jews who revolted against the Greek Seleucid Empire, whose deeds are celebrated every year by the Jews at Hanukkah. A few inhabiting Marcota rescuing Dionysius of Alexandria, AD 255. Armenian Christians warring against Maximus when he came after them because of their faith, AD 310. Christians defended Athanasius against Syrianus, the emperor's captain, A.D. 342. Christians in Constantinople defended Paulus against Constantius, the emperor, killing his captain, Hermogenes, A.D. 356. Emperor Constans deposed Paulus from his ecclesiastical post of patriarch of Constantinople and replaced him with heretic Macedonius, A.D. 342. Christians conducted an insurrection yielding much bloodshed, the deposition of Macedonius, and the reinstatement of Paulus. In the course of the conflict, Macedonius had arranged for an edict from the emperor to destroy the non-Aryan Orthodox Christian churches. But the Christians of the town of Mantinium slaughtered the soldiers who came to destroy their buildings. Basil the Great was threatened with death in Caesarea, but the people took up arms to protect their pastor. A.D. 356. We need not continue the list to include the Bohemian Christians who resisted Queen Drahomica in A.D. 894, the military campaigns of the Hussites led by John Ziska, circa 1420, the defense of by arms waged by the Waldenses, 12th and 15th century, and on and on. Neither is it necessary for us to analyze each case in an attempt to distinguish good from bad examples of the use of force. We concede the fact that there are illegitimate uses of force. The point is not to establish the fact that such examples exist, but to exemplify a truth which many seem to be forgetting. It is this. There has always, in all times, been participation by Christians in forceful conflagrations. And these actions, while individually subjectable to critical evaluation, cannot be categorically rejected as unbiblical types of behavior. Godly use of force by the individual or an ad hoc band of individuals for the purpose of protecting the innocent has never, as a principle, been rejected by the people of God. It has not been condemned by councils or creeds or statements of faith. Politically correct or biblically just, we shall cite a few more recent and familiar examples. Nat Turner was a Christian slave, suffering under the oft-times brutal conditions of a racist brand of slavery. Turner's barbarous effort to defend himself and his fellow human beings struck folks with horror at the time. 
In 1831, he and several fellow slaves slew 13 men, 18 women, and 24 children. Horrific as this deed was, today having our minds thoroughly washed of any tolerance for slavery, the American populace and those in the church ignore the deed as an insignificant incident attending to the greater good of the active eradication of slavery. Consequently, the horror of Turner's deed gives way to praise of his heroic effort to stop slavery. And his execution is lamented more than the deaths of the innocent children. One finds his story included among those of black heroes and role models in a series. The foreword of the book on Nat Turner is written by Coretta Scott King. Included in the series are books on Malcolm X and revolt leader Denmark Vesey. It is recommended for the fifth grade student level in Children's Books and Prints, Volume 2, 1993, published by R. R. Bowker. Joseph Sink was one of 53 slaves on board the Amistad, a slave ship going from Havana to Puerto Principe. He killed the captain and the cook and took over the ship. Later he was captured, but vindicated. The American and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society arranged for payment for his return to his native Africa. Denmark Vesey purchased his freedom with money he won in a lottery in 1800. After settling in Charleston, South Carolina, and making his living as a carpenter, he became inspired by the biblical account of the Exodus. Three hundred daggers and numerous bayonets were gathered for a plot to revolt. Informants spoiled the plans, which ended in 113 arrests, and at least 47 condemned to death. Were these deeds of Turner, Sink, and Vesey righteous? Was it just and good to plot the deaths of others to gain freedom when there were no innocent lives threatened? Maybe. Kidnapping is a capital crime by biblical standards. Presumably, one can slay one's captors in order to gain liberty from unlawful tyranny. However, we think they had less justification in seeking their own freedom than had Griffin and Shannon in attempting to spare the lives of others. However, our racism-sensitive culture would view the behavior of Turner and company with favor and lack any sense of compassion for the one seeking to deliver and protect the preborn. But this present attitude is not a product of scrupulous ethical evaluation. John Brown was a Christian abolitionist who attempted to forcefully deliver American slaves from bondage. He initiated in Pennsylvania in 1834 an effort to educate black people which he carried on for 20 years. In 1855, he followed five of his sons to the Kansas Territory, a center of the national struggle over slavery. Under his leadership, the Brown Boys resisted marauding pro-slavery terrorists from Missouri who had murdered abolitionists in Lawrence, Kansas. Brown and his sons retaliated by killing five pro-slavers on May 24, 1856, in Pottawatomie. In August, Brown and his followers successfully resisted a large party of attacking Missourians. The fame of John Brown served to draw the financial support of prominent abolitionists in the northeastern states, enabling him to effectuate a plan to arm slaves and free them by force. On October 16, 1859, an attempt was made. Brown led a band of 18 men, including several of his sons, in an attempt to seize the U.S. arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. He succeeded in temporarily holding the town, but took no offensive action. Holding defensive positions in the town, he and his would-be rescuers of the slaves were surrounded and soon defeated by the forces of Robert E. Lee. Ten of Brown's men, including two of his sons, were killed. Brown was wounded and forced to surrender. Arrested and charged with crimes including treason and murder, he was hanged on December 2, 2nd, 1859. Soon after Brown's death with the outbreak of civil war, praises to a martyr were sung. They still are. Harper's Ferry commemorates the attack with the preservation of the antiquities of the town and memorials to the men. A farm in New York, once owned by Brown and holding his remains, is preserved. A ten-foot statue of John Brown, with his arm protectively around a black boy, stands in front of the house. Prior to the execution, Henry David Thoreau delivered a speech to the citizens of Concord, Massachusetts, October 30, 1859. Of Brown, 
he said. He was like the best of those who stood at Concord Bridge once, on Lexington Common, and on Bunker Hill. Only he was firmer and higher principled than any that I have chanced to hear of as there. It was no abolition lecturer that converted him. Ethan Allen and Stark, with whom he may in some respects be compared, were rangers in a lower and less important field. They could bravely face their country's foes, but he had the courage to face his country herself, when she was in the wrong. He was a superior man. He did not value his bodily life in comparison with ideal things. He did not recognize unjust human laws, but resisted them as he was bid. For once we are lifted out of the trivialness and dust of politics into the region of truth and manhood. No man in America has ever stood up so persistently and effectively for the dignity of human nature. In that sense, he was the most American of us all. He needed no babbling lawyer, making false issues, to defend him. He was more than a match for all the judges that American voters or office holders, of whatever grade, can create. He could not have been tried by a jury of his peers, because his peers did not exist. When a man stands up serenely against the condemnation and vengeance of mankind, rising above them, literally by a whole body, even though he were of late the vilest murderer who has settled that matter with himself. The spectacle is as sublime one. Didn't ye know it, ye liberators, ye tribunes, ye republicans, and we become criminal in comparison. Do yourselves the honor to recognize him. He needs none of your respect. Immediately after the raid, regular citizens and even abolitionists denounced Brown. Thoreau devotes a large portion of his speech to the denunciation of Brown's detractors. With no small amount of sarcasm, he scorns those who puzzled themselves in contemplation of Brown's strange behavior. On the whole, my respect for my fellow men, except as one may outweigh a million, is not being increased these days. One of my townsmen observed that he died as a fool dieth. Others, craven-hearted, said disparagingly that why he threw his life away. Because he resisted government. Which way have they thrown their lives, pray? Such as would praise a man for attacking singly an ordinary band of thieves or murderers. I hear another ask, Yankee-like, well, what's he going to gain by it? as if he expected to fill his pockets by this enterprise. Well, no, I don't suppose he could get four and sixpence a day for being hung, but then he stands a chance to save a considerable part of his soul, and such a soul, when you do not. No doubt you can get more in your market for a quart of milk than for a quart of blood, but that is not the market that heroes carry their blood to. Such do not know that like the seed is the fruit, and that, in the moral world, when good seed is planted, good fruit is inevitable, and does not depend on our watering and cultivating, that when you plant or bury a hero in his field, a crop of heroes is sure to spring up. This is a seed of such force and vitality that it does not ask our leave to germinate. The major media was an object of Thoreau's rhetorical wrath, but more particularly did he decry the establishment's anti-slavery societies. I read all the newspapers I could get within a week after this event, and I do not remember in them a single expression of sympathy for these men. I have since seen one noble statement in a Boston paper, not editorial. Even the Liberator called it, quote, a misguided, wild, and apparently insane effort, unquote. As for the herd of newspapers and magazines, I do not chance to know an editor in the country who will deliberately print anything which he knows will ultimately and permanently reduce the number of his subscribers. They do not believe that it would be expedient. How, then, can they print truth? If we do not say pleasant things, they argue, nobody will attend to us. And so they do like some traveling auctioneers who sing an obscene song in order to draw a crowd around them. How strange appear the prophets of benighted peoples. 
when a population grows accustomed to an evil, when, in fact, the evil is institutionalized, opponents appear more and more strange, eccentrics, extremists, or, as Thoreau says, insane, a father of six sons, and one son-in-law, and several more men besides, as many as least as twelve disciples, all struck with insanity at once, while the same tyrant holds with a firmer grip than ever his four millions of slaves, and a thousand sane editors, his abettors, are saving their country and their bacon. Just as sane were his efforts in Kansas. Ask the tyrant, who is his most dangerous foe, the sane man, or the insane? Those who function in prophetic roles are small in number. For the majority of the population in times of general apostasy are well duped by the spirit of the age. And so Thoreau gives attention to those who are concerned about the weight of majority opinions. I hear many condemn these men because they were so few. When were the good and brave ever in the majority? Would you have had him wait till that time came? Till you and I came over to him? The fact that he has no rabble or troop of hirelings about him would alone distinguish him from ordinary heroes. His company was small indeed, because few could be found worthy to pass muster. Each one who there laid down his life for the poor and oppressed was a picked man, culled out of many thousands, if not millions. These alone were ready to step between the oppressor and the oppressed. Surely, they were the very best men you could select to be hung. That was the greatest compliment which this country could pay them. They were ripe for her gallows. So it is that those who would stand for God's standard in any given time of apostasy or delusion appear strange. They stand in conflict with the majority, and they are few. The delusion is of such a strength as to deceive all to some degree. Were it not for the grace of God, even the elect would be deceived. But by his grace a remnant is preserved. God calls out his servants for extraordinary tasks in especially backslidden times. Were it not for these, this grace, true darkness would engulf civilization. Thoreau contends for this Christian idea of call or divine vocation against those who can tolerate so uh, no supernaturally bestowed authorization for prophetic intervention. Newspaper editors argue that also it is a proof of his insanity that he thought he was appointed to do this work which he did. They talk as if it were impossible that a man could be a divinely appointed in these days to do any work whatever, as if vows and religion were out of date as connected with any man's daily work, as if the agent to abolish slavery could only be somebody appointed by the president or by some political party. They talk as if a man's death were a failure, and his continued life, be it of whatever character, were a success. Since Brown was confronting an injustice which had rooted itself into the institutions of the government, Thoreau saw no need to bother with lawyers. Let lawyers decide trivial cases. If they were the interpreters of the everlasting laws which rightfully bind man, that would be another thing. A counterfeiting law factory standing half in a slave land and half in free. What kind of laws for freemen can you expect from that? Thoreau, addressing the townspeople on the eve of the Civil War, spoke auspiciously about government in his speech. When a government puts forth its strength on the side of injustice, as ours to maintain slavery and kill the liberators of the slave, it reveals itself a merely brute force, or worse, a demoniacal force. The only government that I recognize, and it matters not how few are at the head of it, or how small its army, is that power that establishes justice in the land. What shall we think of government to which all the truly brave and just men in the land are enemies, standing between it and those who it oppresses? A government that pretends to be Christian and crucifies a million Christs every day. Is not that government fast losing its occupation and becoming contemptible to mankind? 
If private men are obliged to perform the offices of government, to protect the weak and dispense justice, then the government becomes only a hired man, or clerk, to perform menial or indifferent services. Of course, that is but the shadow of a government whose existence necessitates a vigilant committee. Any man knows when he is justified, and all the wits in the world cannot enlighten him on that point. The murderer always knows that he is justly punished. But when a government takes the life of a man without the consent of his conscience, it is an audacious government and is taking a step towards its own dissolution. As to the use of force to accomplish a justice, Thoreau speaks quite simply about the amorality of force, illustrating its use for good causes which are familiar to all. It was his peculiar doctrine that a man has a perfect right to interfere with the slaveholder in order to rescue the slave. I agree with him. I shall not be forward to think him mistaken in his method who quickest succeeds to liberate the slave. I speak for the slave when I say that I prefer the philanthropy of Captain Brown to that philanthropy which neither shoots me nor liberates me. I do not wish to kill nor to be killed, but I can foresee circumstances in which both these things would be by me unavoidable. We preserve the so-called peace of our community by deeds of petty violence every day. Look at the policeman's billy and handcuffs. Look at the jail. Look at the gallows. Look at the chaplain of the regiment. I think that for once the Sharps rifles and the revolvers were employed in a righteous cause. The tools were in the hands of one who could use them. The same indignation that is said to have cleared the temple will clear it again. The question is not about the weapon, but the spirit in which you use it. No man has appeared in America as yet who loved his fellow man so well and treated him so tenderly. He lived for him. He took up his life, and he laid it down for him. It is always more difficult for someone to make sound ethical judgments in a situation where his own well-being is in jeopardy. The evil of one's own time is difficult to discern because of the attendant duty to resist it. How much easier it is to judge the actions of those who are outside of our own time. We don't share the same burden as that borne by people of another time and circumstance. Liberators of more recent memory. We turn now from the analogies in the anti-slavery movement illustrated in the life of John Brown to similar examples in the resistance to Nazism in Europe. Again, since our lives are not at stake, we can easily criticize the derelicts and vindicate the activists. The most renowned among those who resisted the Holocaust, which National Socialism produced in Europe under the Nazi regime, was a Christian pastor and theologian, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. The situation under Hitler drove Bonhoeffer to abandon pacifist tactics and participate in a plot to assassinate the president of his own country. He justified regicide in that situation. According to a friend, Bonhoeffer used to say, it is not only my task to look after the victims of madmen who drive a motor car in a crowded street, but to do all in my power to stop their driving at all. Indeed, the fanatical devilish forces within National Socialism left no alternative. They were aiming at the destruction of Germany as a European and Christian country. As force has been justified to the extent of terminating a head of state, so forceful defense of an individual who is being threatened wrongfully is certainly justifiable. Another example from the same historical period follows. The Gestapo was constantly on the alert for the thousands of Jews who seemed to burrow into the ground like moles. Among their allies were collaborationists, professional informers, anti-Semites, drunks, and prattlers. To anyone turning in a Jew, the Gestapo usually paid one quart of brandy, four pounds of sugar, and a carton of cigarettes, or a small amount of money. The host was usually executed on the spot, or hanged in a public space as an object lesson to Aryans who entertained the notion of hiding a Jew. In 1942, when the Germans ran amok slaughtering the Jews of Tarnopol, Several desperate men and women pleaded with a Ukrainian doorkeeper to let them hide in the large abandoned attic of an office building. 
They were aware that the ground floor of the building was occupied by the Gestapo, but they were surrounded. All avenues of escape were closed. The old doorkeeper agreed and let them upstairs. He did not reveal the terrible secret even to his wife. He bought food for his tenants from his own money and took it to them after office hours, when the ground floor was empty. One day, unable to sustain the burden of his secret, the doorkeeper revealed it to his wife. At a party, after several drinks, she whispered the intelligence to her brother, who hated Jews. The brother threatened to go to the Gestapo, and the doorkeeper tried dissuading him. They quarreled, fought, and as the brother-in-law started for the door to summon the Gestapo, the doorkeeper grabbed an axe and killed him. After the German retreat and the return of the Russians, the doorkeeper helped his 21 Jewish guests to settle in Zbaraz. One day he came to his friends and pleaded with them to hide him because his wife and her family were seeking to avenge the man he had slain. When the Jews made preparations to immigrate, the old doorkeeper joined them. Le the Lvau cattle dealer Josfek met a different fate. He was hanged in a public square for concealing 35 Jews. His body was left dangling for several days as a warning to others. In Athens, twelve Greeks were publicly hanged for helping a group of Jews to escape. On occasion, Jewish guests, fearful of the consequences to their hosts if they were caught, left the places of safety of their own free will, often to commit suicide. We are trailed and hunted, wrote Francisca Rubenlight of Warsaw. We can no longer find a place to hide. Our money is gone. We cannot stay here any longer because we have been threatened with being reported to Gestapo. If this happens, our pro protectors will suffer as well. We cannot commit suicide in this place because our protector will be victimized. So we have decided, the note goes on to say, to surrender. In the knowledge that we can swallow the suicide pills that now constitute our only, our priceless possession. Force, we declare, has historically been acknowledged to be a legitimate method available to citizens for self-defense and the defense of others. It is only the distorted moral vision of those blinded by their own tolerance of evil which leads them to loathe the godly use of force. The Ukrainian doorkeeper's wife was tolerant of what we now call the Holocaust. She thought her husband had done wrong in slaying her brother. Had not the brother simply attempted to do a lawful thing, was he not right to report the illegal hiding of Jews from the authorities? The sister and the Nazis would call it murder. Today, with the veil lifted from our eyes, we would call it justifiable homicide. Under the government of Germany, the twelve Greeks and the cattle dealer committed capital crimes by hiding. Today, the same action is regarded as heroism. The situation was a desperate one for those whose moral vision was not perverted. Lives were at stake, unwanted persons, for certain, your own if you attempted to rescue the others. So it was with that Holocaust, now universally loathed, and so it has been with the miscarriages of justice through time. When the spirit of the time changes, and the standard of God is abandoned, the righteous suffer. The spirit of the times permitted the great evil of kidnapping and slavery. Good men knew better and withstood it. Nat Turner and John Brown were hanged for, quote, murder and, quote, treason. And that same spirit permitted the extermination of ethnic groups in 20th century Europe, along with those who resisted. Was it so difficult to understand that people would resist man-stealing, and race-based slavery with force. Is it absurd to consider the way of Bonhoeffer in removing the mad driver of the vehicle of Nazism? The anti-slavery societies sought to change minds by argumentation. The university students of Munich were executed for their efforts to distribute subversive literature. And which kind liberator did the slaves and Jews prefer? What kind of protector would people in wombs like to have outside the abortion chamber? Theoretically, 
There might be those noble victim souls willing to suffer and die for the sake of transitional peace, as an evil is gradually eradicated. There are those who insist on avoiding force and war at any cost. Let us imagine a pacifist in the womb who would object to the forceful rescue of himself. But it does seem presumptuous on the part of the alleged defenders of the innocents to deny them the choice. Therefore, we will suspend judgment of those who have deemed it their duty to stop child slaughter by any means necessary. There is a delusion in our time which has lured many in denial of the humanity of preborn people. But there is yet another which has blinded even Christians concerning the means of resistance. Force, of itself, is not an evil. It is not outside the province of responsible Christian action. There is a godly use of force, which has always been acknowledged as biblical truth. Our particular age of peace, even the Pax Americana, has seduced many into a love for peace which exceeds a love for righteousness. After the delusion is dispelled, those who were prosecuted as criminals will suddenly become heroes. So it has been, so it will be.